Good morning. morning. Do you remember this? Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. (laughs) Steve Miller's lyrics to his 1970s hit song, Fly Like an Eagle, kept playing in my mind as I was thinking about Luke's version of the Transfiguration, which we read today. With slight variations, the Transfiguration appears in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It was an important event in Jesus' ministry, not to be dismissed as merely a cleverly disguised myth, as it says in Peter's letter. At first glance, the transfiguration is rather baffling. Why I'd be thinking about fly like an eagle was also baffling to me at first. Time is a linear progression from then to now to later, right? Time is a stable, invisible quality that can be measured by clocks right? What possible connection could that have with the transfiguration? To find out, I did some exploring. I discovered that the transfiguration is not only about some temporary, unexpected changes that Jesus underwent, it's also about the transfiguration of time itself. I'd like to share this with you today. So please join me as we slip into a little time travel. To begin with, not everyone on the planet has always viewed time as slipping straight ahead into the future. Ancient astronomers watched time play out in the sky in a more circular way to them, the entire nighttime skyscape with its patterns of stars, quick moving planets, and occasional comets seemed to revolve around the Earth in an orderly and majestic cycle, as if we're inside a ball or a dome that circles over our heads To them, the starry skies were picture books about gods and goddesses. Their deities were cold and distant, yet they were believed to somehow influence the course of human life. By watching the night sky, astrologer priests thought that they could predict what would happen on Earth. According to author and Hebrew scholar Jeff Benner, the ancient Hebrews were among those who viewed time as circular, not just linear. They didn't go in much for astronomy or astrology, however. Those were for the people of lesser gods to study. The Hebrews' one god, Yahweh, could operate outside of time and space and therefore could create time and space. But Yahweh also operated within creation. Yahweh was neither cold nor distant, but loving and responsive to all creation with a special fondness for people. The Hebrews saw endless cycles of birth, life, death, creation, existence, destruction, repeating themselves over and over again, not in exact duplications, but with unmistakable similarities, like resemblances among family members. Human families were very special to God and therefore crucial 
to the Hebrew belief system. Jewish families traced their roots back thousands of years to Abraham and thousands of years before that to Noah and Adam and Eve. Jewish prophets remembered the travel of their collective families through time, compared that history with their own times, and predicted events that would be likely to happen again. Many early cultures valued mountains for the clear view they gave of the stars they wanted to read. The Hebrews did not value mountains this way. <clears throat> to them, mountains were places where Yahweh was believed to hang out, at least occasionally. Those whom Yahweh especially favored might even catch a glimpse of the Most High, disguised in some natural form, like a cloud or a burning bush. As we saw in today's first reading, Moses returned from a divine mountaintop conference with his face so iridescently shiny that he had to wear a veil so as not to terrify people. When he spoke to God, he took away the veil. Taking away the veil is the literal meaning of a Greek word you'll recognize. Apocalypse. Apo means take away from or remove. Calypse or calypso is from the Greek word meaning veil or covering. Apocalypse means removing the barrier that usually prevents us from seeing beyond the here and now, seeing into the beginning or into the end. As the author of Genesis, Moses' view was to the beginning. And as the author of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, he has allowed us to examine in detail the elements of our spiritual heritage. Today, Luke invites us to ascend a mountain with Jesus, Peter, John, and James. We're told that Jesus' intention was to pray, something he often did alone in high places. But today, Jesus wanted to reveal something extraordinary, extraordinary, something outside the usual order of things. Luke gives us a big clue as to what it is in the passage immediately before the one we read today. Jesus tells his disciples, truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. In other words, some of you will see heaven while you're still alive. The hike up the mountain was grueling. The disciples were exhausted and fell asleep. They awoke to see Jesus in close conversation with Moses, who had lived some 1,400 years before Christ, and with the prophet Elijah, who had lived around 900 BCE. The three disciples witnessed these two men from the deep past there with Jesus in what was then the present, chatting about the future. The subject was Jesus' upcoming departure in Jerusalem. His exodus would be accomplished there. And Luke permits us from the far future to witness this as well by hearing these words and envisioning this scene. This lifting of the veil over time is a special viewing that God gifted Peter, John, James, 
and us. It's a sneak preview of what we can't see and can barely grasp while we're still alive. It's an apocalypse, a moving away of what separates us from observing the glory of God that's actually around us all the time. It's a visual statement about God's realm. God's realm includes all that is past, all that is, and all that will come. God's realm is stunning. Jesus had probably hiked up the mountain in his everyday clothes, but now he's dressed in raiments of dazzling white, white like lightning. His face has also changed. Perhaps we see glimpses on it of those with special significance to God, like Melchizedek, said to have lived about 2,400 years before Jesus or Mother Teresa, who would live some 2,000 years in the future, or Mahatma Gandhi, or Martin Luther King, or maybe images of the whole human species ran across Jesus' face. Perhaps our own faces appeared on his for a nanosecond. Luke's lack of detail here allows us to fill in the blank however the Holy Spirit inspires us. The ancient cyclical view of time is also evident here. Part of Jesus' ministry was to continue Moses' mission to gather the lost sheep of the 12 tribes and free them from the captivity they now experienced under the Romans. Like Elijah, Jesus would ascend and pass his mantle not to a single successor, but to his apostles throughout the ages. Then the cycle would begin again. Jesus' own miraculous existence, his crucifixion, and the miracle of his resurrection were an alpha, an omega, and an alpha, a circle in which we ourselves are now participating through our faith. True to his limitations as a mere mortal, Peter responded with much enthusiasm to the vi vision that God had prepared but without understanding it. His suggestion that it would be good to make dwellings there on the mountain for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah was way off the mark. But his error helps us further understand the message. Individual dwellings for these timeless figures would have created three separate temples in which to capture them in what was then the present time and space. An utterly futile idea. The words were still escaping from Peter's lips when, when God appeared as a cloud and overshadowed the group. This is my son, my chosen, God said. Listen to him. These words at the end of Jesus' journey echo those that God spoke at the beginning of it when John the Baptist baptized him. Obediently, the disciples kept mum about the transfiguration until after Jesus' exodus was accomplished. Even if they didn't have insight into what had just happened, the disciples would have benefited from this spiritual boost. Viewing the glory of God would strengthen their faith as they experienced the curve of their own lives in the difficult years to come. We, too, can take 
spiritual comfort as the curve of our lives keeps slipping into the future. When time, as we know it, finally transfigures into eternity. In the precious name of Jesus the Christ, amen.